Good afternoon, everyone. Wonderful to see you. Good to be together. There's no better place that you can be this afternoon than here, sitting under the Word of God as we meet Jesus. That's what we are, we are about, and um, it is, this is a wonderful passage for us to, to work through together as we uh, see Jesus in action yet again. Um, as, a, as a way of introduction, um, I, was reading, I was reading News 24, as I do, um, the other day, and it stated last month, the end of the last month, there was this, uh, this, this, this article that said the U.S. Powerball Lottery stood at its, one of its biggest it's ever been, 935 million U.S. dollars was up for grabs. So something like 400 odd, 400 million dollars cash takeaway, because I think you've got to pay tax and all those kind of things off the, the prize money. And there's a, so it's like 17 billion rand, that total figure, I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy what, uh, what was up for grabs. And I actually don't know if anybody won it. But it got me thinking, as I'm sure it's got you thinking right now, what would I do? What would I do if I won that kind of money? What would be your first purchase? If you're anything like me, what would be your second and third purchase? Because I already have like a, a <laughs> list of things. And I think the tops would be a first class ticket to Greece sitting on an island somewhere. That would be great. It's been a couple of months, right? It's a revealing question though, isn't it? If you, if you, if you had access to that kind, that kind of money, how would you choose to spend those winnings? And it really does kind of show us what we value. We'd all spend it in a different way, and the way we'd spend it would show off what's kind of going on in our hearts. What we think is important is, is how we then spend. Now, it's one thing winning some money in a lottery, but what if, we could, what if we could ask God, the creator of the world, for anything? You know, there's only so much money can actually do. It can do a lot of stuff, but there's loads of things money can't do. And so what would you do? Imagine for a moment God offered you a blank check to use his power for anything you desired. What would you want him to do for you? It's exactly the question that is posed here, uh, and it's posed twice in this passage before. It's posed by two very different people, and two very, pe- very different people in two very different situations here in Mark 10. Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? And it's going to be a great diagnostic question for our hearts this afternoon. It's going to show off our expectations of Jesus, and it will also show off what we think his, expect, ex, his expectations of us are. And so my prayer is that through encountering these two conversations, that Jesus will disciple you, that he'll disciple us here, wherever you are in your Christian journey, whether you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, for many years, or whether you've been walking with Jesus for a couple of days, uh, Jesus is here to coach us, to, to train us, to teach us, to follow after him. So let's bow And let's ask that God would do that in and through uh, his word this afternoon. Father, thank you so much for the fact that we have your word. Thank you that by the power of your spirit, you drive truth into our hearts. That you don't leave us here on our own to figure out life for ourselves. But Jesus reveals you. And he teaches us the path to life. And he teaches us how to live. And so, Father, as Jesus' words really... um, uh, they're going to really challenge our hearts today and challenge our priorities. We pray that by the power of your Spirit, we would be quick to change, that we'd be quick to listen, that we'd be slow to question, uh, that we wouldn't try and get through any loopholes that we might uh, desire, but we would listen to Jesus and come to him and follow after him. And we ask these things in his precious name. Amen. Okay, we've seen over the past few weeks that that Jesus' disciples, they're really in desperate need for discipleship. Um, they, they've, they've figured out who Jesus is, but they, don't, they still don't understand what his mission is. And they certainly haven't understood what it means to follow after him. And so Jesus needs to correct them. Last week, Monday helped us understand from Mark chapter 9 that the disciples have a wrong understanding of greatness. And that's going to be the theme through chapter 10 as well. Uh, they've, they've misunderstood greatness. They, they, they were on the road together, walking in a little huddle, and they were arguing with themselves, who's the greatest disciple? Who's the best? And Jesus challenged them by saying that greatness is not holding the highest place, but, but serving those who are the weakest in society, those who are often the, the unlovables, uh, those who are the downcast, the lowly, and, and, and especially those who are unable to pay you back. That's what, that's what service looks like. True greatness lies in that kind of humility. And that kind of cues our passage this week. We, we have Jesus now. He's walking ahead on the road, and he's got the disciples in a little pack behind him. 
And do you notice what James and John do? They speed up. And they catch up to Jesus. And they want to ask him something. Have a look at verse 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached him and said, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask you. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They answered, Allow us to sit at your right and your left in your glory. It is the greatest shotgun of all time. Isn't it? First one to see it and calls it, gets it. James and John realize, they realize where Jesus is headed. They realize that this is, this is the Messiah. They, they've, they profess that. Peter's professed it already. Here's the one who's on the way to glory. They, they, they've seen him. Peter, James, and John, a few weeks ago we saw. They, they've seen Jesus transfigured on the mountain. They know that he is the king. And so they sidle up to Jesus and sneaky, sneaky, they shotgun the front row seats. They want to sit at Jesus' right and Jesus' left. And now, now Peter, James, and John, they were, they were well, at least they described to us a little bit like, the, like Jesus in a circle, his closest disciples. And it's kind of easy for us to roll our eyes at James and John's request here. Often like, oh, you know. Often with Peter, I'm like, oh, Peter again, you know. And, and, and it's, it's easy to see James and John and think that their request is kind of this arrogant sort of backstabbing nature to them. And yes, they are looking for power, aren't they? That's quite clear to see. To sit at Jesus' right and left is to be Jesus' go-to guys. They want to be generals of, of Jesus' army. They, they want to be the top dogs in God's kingdom, in Jesus' kingdom. Uh, Jesus gave these brothers the name Sons of Thunder in Mark chapter 3, and we're not told exactly why, but I wonder if it's because they do seem to be like these all-guns-blazing kind of men. They, 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 call for, they, they ask Jesus if they can call fire down from heaven, on a town in Luke chapter 9, because they've rejected Jesus, this town has rejected Jesus. These are guys that are not faithless. These are guys who are definitely for Jesus. And remember, these are the guys who Jesus has taught to ask anything in my name. And so they're doing that. They come up to Jesus and they ask him something before any of the others. Huh? They're driven. Here are ambitious men. And, and none of those things are wrong. And neither is... They're asking of Jesus. Jesus calls us to, to speak to him and ask him. But it's what they are requesting that reveals what is happening in their hearts and that they've still misunderstood Jesus' mission. He's on the way to glory, but there's a lot that's got to happen on that way. They have power on their minds, and they think that Jesus is an avenue to gaining what they want. They are ambitious, and Jesus can, can smooth the path to gain not just glory for God, but also glory for themselves. And notice here, it's, it's wrapped up in a lot of kind of religious talk. Teacher. They, they, they're submitting themselves to Jesus. There's a recognition of who he is. Teacher, give us what we want. It's as if they are, they are earnestly coming to him and asking him for something. But, but did you notice there, here that, that discipleship for them is, is a kind of self-serving Following, up, following Jesus kind of matches nicely with what they want. And um, doesn't that sound a little bit like us? I'm often tempted to think that Jesus is nice to follow when I can get what I want. I'll follow Jesus to gain friends and to gain family and to gain community. And those are all wonderful blessings of following after Jesus. The contemporary church wants to use Jesus as a pathway to health and to wealth. And it's all, it's all wrapped up in, in, in very religious-sounding talk. But you notice what's happened to discipleship there? It's become self-serving. And, and, and Jesus' mission turns inward, and it becomes about us. And, and what I love about this passage is that Jesus is just so patient. He's so patient with James and John. He, he doesn't shout. He doesn't wag his finger at them. He, he doesn't wash his hands of them. He gently corrects and teaches them. And that gives me loads of hope this afternoon because that's how he teaches us. Discipleship is a, is a journey of learning. It's a discipleship of repentance and faith. These guys here, as they are following after Jesus, they are not the finished product. But God changes us slowly. We're not the finished product either, either this afternoon. He's working in us. He's slowly chipping away at us so that we live, we, we pull our lives in line and walk in the same direction Jesus is walking. This same James here, who's asking for these things, this same James was willing to die for Jesus, and he does. 
Acts chapter 12. Go read the, the intro to Acts chapter 12. Gives up his life for this Jesus. This is the same John who lived a life standing for Christ and was imprisoned. He didn't have a big name for himself. You know, he wasn't popular. There he sat in jail as an old man for Christ. But here in Mark chapter 10, they haven't understood this. They haven't understood what it means to follow after him. And so Jesus says this in verse 38. He says, you don't know. You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Now, um, in the Bible, this, this language of, of cup is, is being given something. It symbolizes something that's allotted to you. And baptism means to be covered over or to immerse. So we're going to immerse Jonathan a little bit later. That's the meaning of the word. And so here, Jesus is using the language of suffering. I mentioned a little bit earlier that they, they know Jesus is going to glory, but that road to glory is a hard one. There's suffering on the way. So Jesus is showing them there's going to be suffering on that road. And, and he says that he has come to drink a cup of hardship. And he's going to be immersed in opposition. That's the idea yeah, that Jesus wants us to see. And if you want to join me, you will suffer rejection. You will also, you will have a cup to drink. And you'll walk a difficult road. And so the question is, can you drink the cup? Can you drink it? And can you experience this baptism with me? James and John, they feel up to the task, right? They're sons of, they're sons of thunder. Yeah, they, they think they can. And Jesus says, you will. You will drink. And you will be baptized. But to sit at my right and left is not mine to give, verse 40. Now, the rest of the disciples, can you imagine, for example, there's, you know, two of them have run ahead. They've now gone and asked Jesus. And they, they, the passage tells us they get a little bit grumpy, a little bit disgruntled with James and John. And can you imagine how hurt Peter must have been? You know, the brothers have kind of formed this alliance with Peter. feels a little bit like Survivor, you know, that sort of idea. But I wonder if the jealousy that caused the disciples to be upset here is, is not because... Um, they, they are better, and they can't believe James and John would ask that. It's just maybe that James and John asked it first. The sons of thunder, they had the confidence to go and call shotgun. Uh, we, see, we saw in chapter 9, they were all arguing over who was the greatest. James and John just want it ratified. They want the place. Jesus, give us that place. And so Jesus calls his disciples in for a little team huddle. And like we saw two weeks ago, the word is actually summon. He, he, it's, 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 not a, it's not a little like... Come join me if you want. He gets everybody together. He has a team talk. Verse 42, to point out how the world thinks about positions of power. Those in authority act like tyrants, don't they? And what do tyrants do? Tyrants, they use their power to push people down. They use their power to get people to do their bidding. And as we look, at, as we look out in the world, isn't that what we see from a lot of our leaders? Nothing's changed. Greatness in this world is to have slaves running around us, doing what we want, attending to us, to be the big cheese, and the one calling all the shots. Have a look at verse 43. What does he say? Not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I mentioned a little bit earlier that last week we, we saw that greatness is seen in humility. And today Jesus adds that. He's showing us that, that greatness through humility results in service of one another. And, and the, the idea is, is almost like a waiter in a, in a restaurant to, be, to wait upon people. And then he adds something else in verse 40, 44. Did you notice there? That, that those who want to be first need to be slave. Slave was a very strong word that Jesus uses there. It's, it's the one who was the lowest in society. There were levels of slavery, levels of service in Jesus' day. The, the, these are the ones who were at the bottom of society, the lowest of slaves, whose only purpose in life was to serve others. You want to be first, that's how you must live. In other words, greatness in God's kingdom is not power, it's not even freedom, but living to serve others. And did you see, did you see how Jesus raises our eyes to, to the length to which we should go? Did you see his example there? For even the Son of Man, that's an Old Testament title. Jesus appropriates to himself this great king. He was coming into the world when he had the authority of God was coming. For even the Son of Man 
did not come to be served. Even though that's what he deserves. The Son of Man deserves praise and worship, glory and honor. And yet he doesn't come to just gather a whole bunch of minions to do his bidding. What does he do? He comes to serve you and me, and he's told to give his life as a ransom for many. Isn't that beautiful? Towards the end of the Gospel of Mark, we see Jesus referring again to the cup. And, and this is none other than the very wrath and anger of God which he will drink. And we're told here that, that he will then be baptized, he'll be covered over. Here's one who'll be immersed in death. His mission is to drink up all the judgment that we deserve and to conquer death on our behalf. Stop for a moment and just think about that. The length of the service with which he was willing to go for us. Jesus came to forgive us through this kind of service. On the cross, Jesus ingests all our punishment. That should have been ours. And then we're told he becomes, he becomes a slave to death. The death on a cross in order to redeem us. And now can offer us, because of this sacrifice, eternal life in and through his glorious resurrection. And so Jesus is calling us as his disciples to see greatness for what it really is. Greatness equals service. And, and we need this constant be told to us, don't we? I, I do. I need to be constantly reminded of this because it's so counterintuitive to how I think and, and so counterintuitive often to how I live. You know, we live in a world where, where we are called to follow after our own, our own hearts. You heard that recently? Uh, we're told that you, you need to chase your dreams to be everything that you want to be. We live in a world of education where you need to have titles, where you need to have degrees to be considered a success. We live in a world of rampant materialism, consumerism, where the more you have, the greater you're seen in society. Ah, you're a success if you have, if you live there, if you drive this. We live, we live in a world that wants to build security and to make life as comfortable for ourselves as possible. We live in a time of big appetites that need constant feeding. And right, right now, we live in a time of instant gratification. You know, check his ASAP. No, no, what's it? Pick and pay ASAP, check his 360, whatever. No, no, no. No? You can get something within an hour nowadays, anything you like from the shops. And we live in a time, how terrible is this? We live in a time where the church has imbibed all of that. And Jesus can be your ticket to all of those things. James and John, they want to climb the ladder. When people see Jesus in glory, they want to be right next to him in places of power. And again, it's easy to write off the disciples, but can you feel the tussle that's in their hearts here? There's a fervent desire for Jesus to be glorified as king, they know it, but then in their selfishness, their desire turns inward, they, they want glory for themselves. And this is the tussle in our hearts, whether you've been a Christian for 50 years or for a day. We want Jesus, but we also want what the world wants. And we want the world, don't we? The problem is that greatness in the world is opposite to greatness in the kingdom. And it gets in the way of us doing kingdom work. When we chase after what the world chases, we become self-seeking and there's little to no space to love others. And you can see it here in the disciples, can't you? James and John want positions of authority over their mates who they've been training with for three years. I want to sit over them. That's, that's what it kind of does. It becomes self-serving, and we push people down. If the orientation of our hearts is to gain glory or popularity or wealth or stuff or security or comfort, there will be limited, if any, desire to share, let alone sacrifice, which Jesus calls us to. So what's Jesus' command to us as his disciples, as his people? Not so with you. Not so with you. From chapter 8, remember what he said to us? What use is it to gain the whole world? And you'd forfeit your souls. The world can only get you so far. And, and then what? And so eternity is, is what is at stake here for Jesus. And, and not just for us, but for others as well. Jesus came to serve and he came to pull people onto this road leading to life. 
eternal life. And he has called us, as he's pulled us onto the road, to follow in his footsteps, to serve others, and to help pull others onto that road with us, to introduce them to Jesus. And and I want you again to let that sink in for a moment. His purpose for us, as his people, as his disciples. Jesus' service gained us forgiveness. Jesus' service gained us eternal life. And our service of others can lead them to finding this forgiveness and this eternal life in Christ too. But it will be costly from a worldly sense. I will need to get out of the way in order to serve. We will need to die to self, but the result is true greatness, according to Jesus, as we join him on his mission to make disciples. He's calling us this afternoon to shift our ambition and to use it for his kingdom. He's calling us to use our education to reach out to others. He's calling us to sacrifice our comforts and securities in order to serve others. And that is an uncomfortable thing, isn't it? It's a difficult thing. Just one example of how Jesus' mission will potentially cost us, and this is what we're going to meet about next week as we think about planting a morning service. It's it's going to be a costly endeavor for us as as a family. We're almost full here on a Sunday. And our kids' classrooms as well are bursting at the seams. And that's, that's a wonderful joy. It's why we planted on this side of town. God has been immensely faithful as we've come to reach people on this side of Maritzburg for Christ. And so Sunday is, is rocking, right? It's wonderful to get together. It's wonderful for church to be full. People are serving. It's great. But there are tens of thousands of people who still need to hear about this Jesus and this life that he offers And so what do we do? Mundy mentioned a little bit earlier. We we need to make space. We need to make space for more to hear, and that will cost us. Starting a new service will cost us time. Starting a new service is going to cost us energy. And and potentially it's going to mean we're going to have to serve in a few more areas for a time. Potentially areas that you don't feel necessarily gifted in. But you might just need to do it to get the job done. It might also cost us that we... We might not see all the same faces that we've gotten used to seeing every week if we go to a different time slot. The temptation is to stay safe. It's to stay comfortable, because that's what church can become. And, and you know, if we, if we split, we'll be unsettled. But Jesus is calling us to reach out. We're, looking, we're seeing that in, in the book of Jonah, right? What is the heart of God? To reach those who are lost. That is his heart, and that is our heart, should be our heart. We, we are called to boldly witness of all that Christ has done and invite people to come along on Sunday and meet Jesus. We want them to meet him. And so there will be pains as we grow and as God faithfully adds to our number. But people will be saved. People will be saved from hell for heaven. Eternal destinies will be changed. Our service of making some space so that people who hear the gospel will bear fruit for God's kingdom for all eternity. Is it not worth it? Is that not worth the sacrifice? And this kind of service is great, according to Jesus. Now, we might not end up splitting in that kind of way. We might come up with all kinds of other ideas next week. The point is, we want to join Jesus on his mission. And so he's gently discipling us today and calling us to look up to him, one who has served us in such an incredible way, and to take the focus off our wants and our ambitions and then turn them around to help meet people's needs, to build his kingdom, Jesus' kingdom, rather than our own. And the second conversation that Jesus now turns to is a kind of working example of his kingdom building that he is doing And the circumstances and the requests could not be more different to that of James and John. So are we all okay? We're going to move on to the next one. We'll we'll be brief here. As Jesus and and a large crowd are leaving Jericho, there we we now meet a blind man. And and he would have been, he's he's a beggar, he would have been the bottom of the social pile, this guy, because of his condition. But I wonder if you noticed how Mark records who he is for us. We meet... James and John, son of Zebedee, in verse 35. Now we meet a blind beggar, Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. We have no idea who he is, but he has a name. 
Just because he's a blind beggar doesn't mean he's a no one. And he may be blind, but his ears and his voice work just fine. Did you, see, did you see what happens there? He hears Jesus walking by, and if there's anybody who can help him, it's that Jesus. He must have heard of what Jesus had been doing. And so do you notice what he yells out? Another name, Jesus, son of David. Son of David. It's the first time in Mark's gospel that Jesus is given this title. And it's another title for a promised king, an eternal promised king, one who's going to usher in the eternal kingdom of God. He shouts out to him. And so the blind man, he, he's blind to the world. He recognizes he recognizes Jesus, and do you see what he cries out for? Mercy. Have mercy on me. He doesn't call out for fame. He doesn't ask for glory. Mercy is what he needs. Do you see what the crowd tries to do? Try to shut him up. Because that's what we often do with those who are below us, right? And what interest would Jesus, the son of David, have with a blind beggar? And isn't Jesus' response just staggering? Yeah. Blind Bartimaeus, he keeps calling all the louder. He ignores what's going on. All the, all the louder. Have mercy on me, son of David. And verse 49, Jesus stopped. The language here is that he stopped dead in his tracks. When Jesus hears a cry for mercy, he listens. And so Bartimaeus, he doesn't shout, I want you to do whatever I ask you, Jesus. This man knows that Jesus owes him nothing. He has nothing to offer Jesus either. No money, no status. But he recognizes that he has a need. And here's Jesus who can restore him. And so Jesus calls the blind man over to him. And he asks him the same question that he asked James and John. Verse 51. He says, what do you want with me? What do you want me to do with you? Rabbi, the blind man said, I want, you to, I, I want to see. So Jesus said to him, go. Your faith is saved you, and immediately he could see and began following Jesus on the road. The disciples, they want glory. Bart wants mercy. He, he needs his sight to be restored, and Jesus meets him in that need. Do you notice the words in the language in verse 52? His faith, Jesus says, your faith has saved you. His, his sight is restored. And do you notice where he ends up? End of verse 52, follow Jesus. Jesus says, go. Where does he go? I'm going with you. Follows after him. And so healing this blind man here is a picture of Jesus' Jesus' mission to make disciples, to open the eyes of those to see him for who he really is so they can receive healing of their greatest need, the forgiveness of our sin so that people can follow after him on this path of life. Mercy is what Jesus has come to show. Lowly fishermen like James and John, this blind beggar here, Bartimaeus, and wealthy business people like Priscilla and Aquila. When people cried for mercy, it was a prayer Jesus answers because that is why he's come. That is his mission. It might be today that you are a little bit like Bartimaeus, Maybe you're an outsider sitting on the road, so to speak. Jesus is passing you by. And you've recognized this is who he is. Here is the eternal king. And you can cry out for him for mercy. And what will he do for you? He will rescue you. His mission was to come make disciples, to forgive you from sin, and to call you to follow him on the road to life. Will you do that today? Follow after him. Come to him. There is nothing you can give him. He owes you nothing, but if you cry for mercy, he will give it to you. And so those of us who are disciples, this is a reminder of Jesus' mission, and we need to be reminded of it. We need to be reminded of all that he's done for us. He's pulled us onto this road to life, and it's a call for us to pull our hearts and desires in line with his. To be reminded of the cost of discipleship. To get out of the way of Jesus' mission. Because often we're in the way because we're running after all kinds of other things. Do you notice the crowd here or the ones shushing Bartimaeus from getting? That can be us. We can get in the way by chasing all kinds of things and having all our priorities wrong. We're here to serve. We're here to sacrifice. And that, friends, is true greatness, according to Jesus, which will lead to others joining us 
as we travel this road to eternity. And so may God grow his church through our service for his glory. Let me pray for us. Father, we we ask for your kindness. Uh, We are like James and John, who so readily are chasing after all kinds of other things. We ask for forgiveness this afternoon, maybe for the first time. Thank you for the joy of being your disciples. Thank you that Jesus, Jesus has come for us and done everything to pull us onto the road and to lead us to glory. And so pull our, pull our hearts in line, pull our desires in line with this mission that he's called us on. And will you make us, Christ's Cascades, this group of small people, will you make us a witness of your grace and your mercy to the suburbs around us. And may you change people's eternal destiny through our service and our sacrifice as we point people to the King of Kings in whose name we pray. Amen.